Great. Let's continue. Well, hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, thank you for joining us here for this session about arts, culture, and creativity in the Agricultural Transition Plan. And um, we have all sorts of different things this evening. I think the first thing is probably say apology that although the, um, the, the blurb for the session says that we'll be watching a film, unfortunately, due to a range of personal circumstances, um, we uh, our filmmaker hasn't been able to complete the project and we are not able to show the film tonight. Um, we will be arranging a screening for this in uh, in the um, in the future, so we can be in touch with you then to uh, to let you know when it will be shown, probably at Lancaster University. But whilst it's a shame, it's not a problem because we it's going to allow some more time for discussion with our presenters and some contributions from our presenters this evening. And I'm just going to share my screen very briefly to go through some of the intentions for the session tonight. Can you see, can you see that? Okay, so this, the intentions for this evening's session is to hear about different artistic and aesthetic practices, which both shape our engagements with land, food and farming, and can be thought of as methods for research, learning, and hopefully policy change and engagement. Think about the historical origins of these and the opportunities for them ahead. And also to generate some discussion and feedback around a new project called the Once and Future Land, um, which, which is we're developing at Lancaster, and to make contacts with those wishing to stay in touch with the project going forward. So I'll just say a quick word on how this session has come about and my own role within it. My name is Louise Carver. I'm an honorary researcher at Lancaster Environment Centre. I'm also an independent researcher and I work a lot with the arts and cultural sector as well. So my role and my time is very much split between research, specifically exploring the sort of science policy processes of natural capital accounting and biodiversity conservation. Um, I work a lot with policy contexts as well. I've just recently completed a project with parliament about land management. And as I said, I'm also working with the arts and culture sector developing creative methods for engagement, learning and inquiry. So a lot of my work today has been concerned with the power and politics of knowledge and specifically the way that the scientific knowledge is supposed to shape policymaking under this rubric of evidence-based policymaking, which is presumed to happen in this sort of linear, neat fashion so that science shapes policy and then it's transferred down the line to real places and people. But this is recognized to not be a particularly effective or indeed realistic route um, because of a few things. First is the type of knowledge that's being generated in the first instance. Generally privilege is very biophysical and experimental science-based kind of research, which is not typically very people-centered. So there's a sort of bias in the, those types of research uh, traditions. The way that this knowledge and this evidence translates into policy is also faulty and the way that it's interpreted along the way um, and then interacts with political cultures and also economic ideologies and the ways in which it hits the ground in practice, whether it's adopted, rejected, embraced by the people that it's supposed to be affecting or, or helping um, and whether in, in fact there is a wider capacity for this evidence-based policymaking to be embraced um, realistically. So you'll probably all be aware of the huge changes that are underway with the agricultural transition plan, the environmental land management scheme, and leaving um, the common agricultural policy in connection with Brexit, and of course the climate and biodiversity emergencies and the questions of our food security. So this question of shifting farming is a hugely complex issue, which you don't need to state, but it's very much shaped by history, culture, norms, values, cares, and concerns not only of farmers, but of course, by wider society and the political class as well. So in other words, these are not merely questions of technical know-how, science, um, straightforward science or economics, but it's up to real people in real places to enact changes, these changes that are anticipated by the government through this agricultural transition plan. But what, to what extent does the government really recognize the sort of people-centered challenges of these, these real place-shaped um, challenges? 
My experience generating evidence of Parliament recently gave me the sense that these questions and these people-centred concerns are just not really given the light of day in any sense in centralised environmental and agricultural policy processes. And a culture of markets, economics and hierarchical frameworks still very much dominate. And yet, of course, these markets and these sort of um, economic frameworks are enabling conditions or either make the policy changes um, possible for people to embrace or not. So these sort of higher scale issues are really shaping what's possible for farmers and land managers on the ground. Um, so the culture of Westminster and its arms length bodies, and frankly, the entire culture of research sectors, including universities like Lancaster, which generate a lot of the research that is intended to shape the evidence for these changes, all of these institutions are under pressure to change and to enable um, collect and collectively generate and use truly transformational kinds of knowledge and policy arrangements, which are both fair, effective and attractive. So as much as this is a kind of cultural challenge for society, for farmers and land managers and all of those people on the front line, we could as much say that this is a cult huge cultural challenge for higher scale actors in research, government and NGOs itself. So with that sort of preamble as a little bit of um, context as to why I'm interested, um, we're all collectively interested in exploring the role of culture in the agricultural transition and also the potential and possibility for artistic practices to work and then also help us learn about that culture. Um, I will introduce our speakers this evening and then hand over them to them each to, to make a contribution. So first of all, I'll introduce Ewan Allison, who is a sculptor, a cultural landscape innovator, a broadcaster, and a master craftsman drystone waller. Ewan is the founder of the Northern Heartlands, a cultural and arts organization working to give space to marginalized voices in farming, and an advisor to the Uplands Alliance. Ewan served as a vice chair of the award-winning HLF Heart of Teesdale Landscape Partnership from 2011 to 2016, and he's currently undertaking PhD research at the University of Dundee's College of Art, exploring the potential for art to help give voice to hill farmers and crofters embedded ways of knowing about land and nature. Daniel Stanley, Daniel Stanley is the CEO of the Future Narratives Lab and co-author with shared assets of the study Power in Place, a new narrative for land. Daniel is also a strategic communication specialist with a background in social psychology and community organizing. He writes and lectures on narrative values and framing. And Maddie Nicholson is the artist founder director of Art Gene and Bower and Furness alongside Stuart Bastic. Her diverse practice involves working primarily with people and place. Her interest is in communities, communities of people, of objects of interest of life and the choices and allegiances that one makes. Her work is concerned with Art Gene's role in bringing intelligent and social economic regeneration and reform to the Bower and Furness area and beyond. And Charlie Gear is a professor of media theory and history at the Lancaster Institute of Contemporary Arts. And he's involved in the Lancaster's Future Places Center, which will run between now and 2025. He's written several books, most recently one provocatively entitled, I Hate the Lake District. And so before we just kick off, and we're gonna go from Daniel to Ewan to Maddie, and then to Charlie, and then I'll just say a word at the end. I just wanted to take a moment to do a little exercise where we can get everybody involved. And if you're comfortable to switch your camera on, that would be really fantastic. Hi, Hannah. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. It's nice to see your faces. Yes, yeah, so we're just going to do a little exercise because um, I would. I would quite like to have a sense of, of who's here in the audience. And this is all just a little participation exercise to, to let us sort of arrive in the space together. So I would like you to take a moment to summon some of your experiences and thoughts and feelings about your understanding of the changes that are underway at the moment. What are your impressions of the agricultural transition and the ELMS policy? Um, or if you don't have any sort of understanding of the agricultural transition in the ELMS policy, perhaps something to do with your reflections on the COP that's just happened in Glasgow. Or if not that, then just perhaps your, a general sense of your perception of the relationship between farmers and society at the moment. 
if you could just take a moment to think about what your feelings and impressions of these things are. And then what I'd like you to do is write three words that come to mind that capture some of these into the chat box. And then one word that captures either your background or your organization or whatever you would like to describe yourself as within one word. And then another word about how your day has been so far. And so I'm just gonna give us 30 seconds or so just to think about this. You want us to do this, um, Louise? I will kick off. Sorry? You want us to do this as well? Yeah. Oh, no pressure. I got chaotic too, Becky. <laughs> it's a bit of a, um, a bit of a, yeah, a catch-all word, isn't it, at the moment for many of the things that we all experience and have to contend with. So, I think almost everyone has popped. Seeing an opportunity. <laughs> yeah, and everyone, uh, quite a few people are saying, I sort of, well, mixed feelings. It's both opportunity, but also panic. Sort of inspiring, but concerned, frustrating, exciting. Yeah, real binary feelings about everything. I just wondered, do we have any actual land managers with us in the house tonight or for those of you who are not part of the panel, we don't have a huge audience, but would you be comfortable just, just either typing in a, a word into the chat to say, you know, where you're coming from, what your background is, or even switching on your mic and just mentioning it? That would be helpful, just so we have a sense of who's with us. Uh, hi, Connor here uh, in Northern Ireland, and I uh, work with community gardens and uh, have a small holding in the house. And I'm a, but I'm also a, a activist, musician, and a performance poet, and uh, that intersects with my land activities quite a lot. Thanks, Connor. That's great. So nice to hear your voices. Yes, you and you're right. We have a small but, but very distinguished audience. Anybody else happy to share? Jasmine, social science researcher, storyteller, and artist. Okay. Right. Well, let's kick off then. I'm going to. Um, Oh, sorry, we've got some more answers. Becky, I'm not a land manager in any traditional sense, but I've been learning from an amazing permaculture designer friend and applying that approach to my allotment garden, community garden. Eddie, retired teacher. Thank you. Lovely. Okay. 
Fantastic. Right then. So let's go into some of the presentations from our equally distinguished panel. So Daniel, uh, if I may hand over to you, I think you should already be a host. Um, so I'll hand over to you for 10 minutes or so, and then we'll move on to Ewan. Sure. Over to you, Daniel. Thank you. Um, share my screen. Yeah, so hopefully you can see that. Um, I've got a few slides uh, of different bits and pieces. Um, yeah, yeah. I will probably kind of shoot through them quite quickly. So hopefully they'll just give you something to look at and I will supply a link at which is possible to kind of look at any of this in more detail if you're interested. But apologies in advance if I kind of skip past things just as you're starting to, to look at them. Um, but I'm very aware of the time I've got. It's not probably realistic to spend much time on each slide. Um, yeah, so just to start with a, a, a little bit about who I am and the organisation I'm representing in this project. So um, I'm part of a, a non-profit, relatively new non-profit called Future Narratives Lab. Um, and we focus, as the name suggests, on narratives, in particular on sort of narrative change. Um, that may not sound much more specific to you than, uh, and maybe a bit vague. I think I'm aware the word narrative gets used very, very broadly by lots of for different lots of different things by lots of different people um but our kind of um way of thinking about it the, the explanation that i like to use the most is probably um narratives are kind of the things that we take for granted are taken for granted understandings of the world so in this diagram um from an organization called the the narrative initiative in the us it is all used quite often to try and illustrate what's meant by it in this particular usage you have um our kind of day-to-day -day discussions and the news and the stories and the topics that we kind of um, debate about and, and discuss. And, um, you know, those go on in a relatively kind of episodic way. Um, but, but if you read between the lines of a lot of that, there are um, understandings that we kind of, and assumptions that we just sort of rely on about the way the world works, um, that kind of, to a degree, uh, govern and prioritize what we um, see as a given as we see as like not even worthy of discussion because that's just the way the world is um, and what we try and do at the narrative lab is try and kind of uncover and unpack those a little bit by analyzing um, the discussions that we have um, and this particular topic I'm going to discuss particular project I'm going to discuss today um, is a collaborative one that we started on um, about a year and a half ago now, um, and we were commissioned by a really interesting organisation called Shared Assets that I would encourage you all to look up if you've not heard of them, um, who work on sort of land reform in the UK and the different sort of more commons based approaches to land. Um, and along with them and a, another really inspiring organisation called Land in Our Names, um, and with some funding from the community, National Lottery Community Fund, um, we worked on, on this project to look at the narrative around land in the UK. Um, yeah, and, and really this project, the genesis of this project was an observation by shared assets that, um, you know, they saw that there was a really critical need for reform of land, that this was connected to all sorts of other um, big social problems that people were experiencing. But despite this, there wasn't really um, much attention being spent on it as a topic, that it wasn't seen as a priority anywhere near as often uh, as it should be, um, with, whether that's within politics or, or within sort of activism or otherwise, it kind of got buried by the topic, so it just wasn't seen as possible. They wanted to understand why that was at the level of narrative, because it felt like it was almost pre-debate that the problem was happening, that it was just sort of not seen as worthy of, of spending time and energy on the, the issue of that reform. So um, they wanted us to look at this. They saw this as a narrative problem. So our approach to kind of try and understand why this was the case, this is one, definitely one of those slides, which I will skip past because it's too much on here, but was essentially we did a kind of uh, relatively classic research process in some ways. We spoke to a, a group of different experts and we did some media analysis where we looked at particular instances where land had, land reform had been discussed in the media or it had been surfaced, whether directly or through other issues like housing or through um, 
things like food growing and uh, some of the stuff during the pandemic as well, during the lockdowns where people had um, spent time in beaches and in parks and how that had been framed within the media. And we looked to sort of extract from that what were the kind of taken for granted understandings about land and how did these relate, you know, how were these framing the issue in ways that prevented reform or kind of more commons based approaches from being seen as a possibility. Um, yeah, and <laughs> again, I have to go past this very quickly, but like fundamentally what we found was that there was a kind of underlying set of assumptions about land and people's relationship to land, particularly that were present in this discourse. Um, and that these kind of were grouped in certain ways. Um, one set was around the way that land works at the moment, that it's kind of intertwined with national identity, that it's kind of part of the sort of natural order of things, that it's, that it's kind of therefore very difficult to shift and would take a huge amount of, of, of effort to do so. Um, also that it's very scarce, that it's running out, uh, that, it's, that it's therefore everyone's kind of competing for their share of it. Um, on the other side, you know, in terms of explanations as for why reform is not possibility, um, there was a lot of implications that that change to land was inherently a kind of dangerous and destabilizing thing, that it would sort of unleash mob rule, um, that there would be a kind of imposition of the collective on the individual and a kind of la a leading to an overall negative for everybody. Uh, or that if that wasn't the case, if, you know, in cases where that seemed absurd, you know, it was pre presented that reform was some sort of kind of idealistic utopian sort of middle class uh, luxury in a way. It was, was often presented in that way. Um, and ultimately, what that kind of um, led to by looking at these and thinking about the relationship between them in the end is that, that we kind of saw there was this sort of central uh, binary relationship that was proposed between within land where it was either presented as this sort of inherently kind of tied in with the structure of our society and therefore very dangerous and to, to destabilize or as something that was um, that you know naturally just something that needed to be exploited and, and a part of the kind of market um, and that the inherently the sort of relationship of land and people was therefore a destructive one of either that we either therefore had to defend land or it needed to be exploited that was it those are the only kind of options that were um, available and, and that these tied into a whole group of sort of social values and like deeper narratives about how society worked um, which you can see more of then and there's more of that in this report which i can i will send you a link to access in this presentation um but the next stage of that was not just okay well this is an analysis of how things are which is you know, interesting to some people and, and um, potentially useful to people thinking about um what they might do to sort of communicate about land more effectively and so on but we also wanted to actually think about well what would a uh, a new narrative look like what would would a better way of speaking that land looked like that might avoid some of these sort of traps um, that that particular narrative sets. Um, and so we went on a consultation process, uh, talking to lots of people from different sort of marginalized communities and land groups, and people working on land during the pandemic and sort of consulting with them about their experiences and views on the topic. You can see me up there with lockdown beard at the top. Um, and yeah, our kind of, uh, what we wanted to do was think about, well, looking at this kind of understanding of how the land and narrative works at the moment, where are the gaps? Where is it possible to kind of um, talk about land in new ways that maybe opens the subject up to people thinking more creatively uh, without kind of triggering this tendency to go into a kind of defensive mode or to, for people to think that it's something kind of idealistic. Um, yeah, and to overcome that kind of gap between exploitation and defense and being the only other options. Um, so, you know, we tried to consider which values were kind of open to appeal to that weren't maybe satisfied by the current narrative and, and which kind of topics it made sense to kind of talk about that, that, that where there was a very kind of widespread dissatisfaction with the way that the current system works. Um, and, you know, there were things like empty homes and kind of, uh, you know, high streets, neglect of heritage food waste sort of pollution and litter these have felt like you know they were identifiably kind of things where there was a very widespread of people from different values that could be see those problems as being ones um that they all agreed they were against and therefore 
were a good way to sort of introduce people back into looking at the land system as the source of these issues as a way to kind of get past any sense in which this was one group of people sort of imposing their ideas on another. Um, yeah, and then, you know, starting to think a bit more about also where were their uh, ideas of sort of things that we actually see in our society that we kind of take for granted a bit that actually kind of were signs of progress and people starting to think a bit differently about land and these called upon kind of projects we talk to but also much more kind of like um you know things are often seen as mundane like cycle lanes and stuff and sort of where there have been developments and beaches sort of taken for granted but actually do represent quite a different set of values about how land should be used especially to people in the sort of urban context um yeah and from this we put together the sort of component parts of what we see as the sort of potential basis for a new narrative about land um i'll talk about each of these different bits and where they came from and what the implications of that are but a lot of it was really about kind of giving a new sense of possibility um that it's a space where people can come together and do things creative healthy things together and, and imagine different futures um and yeah to so we saw a kind of rather than there being this binary there was more of a sort of cycle of three different elements um each with their own kind of principles and, and connection between them um but you know this lab i think a lot of the time we're very aware this kind of work can seem quite abstract and sort of detached from from you know, what does this actually mean in practice what does this look like so we were keen to also uh, show develop something that was kind of more of an example of what this might look like so if i have got time i will show a short film i've seen a nod louise no is that okay two three minutes um which was a, a short film we made at the end of this process um to sort of represent what how we believe the um what the narrative could look like as an example um so if you give me second hopefully this will come through to you
and I'll leave it there, I guess. I mean, um, I could easily talk more about some of the different elements of this, but there's a, um, I'm very aware that it's not necessarily that much about arts in its way or, or necessarily about kind of farming and that aspect, of it, although both those things are relevant to this, but um, hopefully there's some parts of it that feel like they provoke some thoughts on this topic. Um, yeah, and there is some more information here if interested as well about the project. Thanks very much, Daniel. Um, yeah, I mean, hopefully we'll, by the end of the session, it will be quite easy to see the connection between all the, the relationship between narratives, for example, and the values that you're talking about and how they actually play out in some of the, the most contested issues, I think, around land management in England and the farming and the rural environment at the moment. And also just, you know, the politics of land use um, in general is obviously deeply connected to urban context and housing and this sort of the, the issue of land that is literally underneath almost every challenge that the government is sort of facing, but not really on the table at all. So it's a really helpful framer for us. So thanks very much. So I'm now going to invite Ewan to share some um, thoughts with us. I think if that's okay, great. Perfect. Yep. And uh, let's see. Great, thank you. Hi, I'll, um, uh, Louise gave me such a nice intro at the start. I don't need to repeat myself on the various hats that I wear. So let's get straight into the presentation, which is really about how we are still uh, very much burdened by uh, the Enlightenment, which was, of course, originally quite liberating for thought and practice in many ways, um, but the, uh, the, the effects of which and the errors of which are beginning to, um, to, to show themselves as being uh, uh, very dangerous, in fact, and have brought us to a very dangerous place. And particularly, I'm thinking in terms of the human and nature binary, and uh, a, a binary which I believe is, uh, is, is repeated by the idea and the use of the term wild in such as rewilding and so on. So this is really a critique of that and the, the, the suggestion of alternatives. So I grew up uh, in a very remote house in the Lake District on the eastern shores of Oswater in a, in a National Trust house which I later discovered uh, had belonged to the uh, romantic era picturesque painter John Glover, who was known as the English Claude, very fantastic painter. Um, and so was, I'm very much a, a product of that romantic era and enlightened era thinking about uh, nature. And I went to Oxford originally to do geology. I'd grown up around, surrounded by these mountains. In, in, in my mid to late teens, I was, I was uh, lucky to, to, to have some influence from some geologists and was fascinated by how that, um, that understanding of geology added so, so much, so many layers of magnitude to my experience of the place's beauty. And I was actually fascinated with that question. And when I was, when I was at university, I actually shifted to geography in order to explore landscape aesthetics more. And of course, uh, this group of gentlemen were um, both British and German, were very much at the heart of these discussions in the 18th century. And it was, it was their thinking around experiences of beautiful the beautiful and the sublime, which really laid the ground for the Romantic era, which immediately followed uh, thereafter. And to sum up really, and this is the critical moment in today's presentation, because it's, um, it, it, it's, it's where we need now to escape from this Kantian framing of what an experience of the beautiful is. And, and the way Kant kind of pulled together the schema that all these different philosophers had been thinking about was thinking about the experience, and this is the problem, the enlightenment puts, puts all of our experience in our heads, okay? So this is where the binary comes in. 
um, our experience is something that takes place only in our heads, okay? And towards the end, I will ch challenge that idea. And he describes the experience of beauty as one in which two faculties come to resonate with each other. So there's this harmony of faculties, which is interesting, this kind of musical metaphor of a harmony of faculty, faculties of the imagination and understanding. And he actually takes that experience of beauty, not as an experience, just a pleasurable experience, but as a profound uh, awakening to truths that are unavailable through other means. So, so an experience of beautiful is, is, is kind of like a window onto something, onto some big truth that, 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 uh, that is universal in its nature and is a form of truth. And so in, in trying to frame this as a form of truth and into subjectivity rather than objectivity, he brings in these various rules around what therefore is a reliable experience of beauty. And at the heart of these rules is this idea of disinterestedness, which, uh, let's put that into layman's term, is really about not having any utilitarian or personal relationship to the place that you're looking at. And I should, should just say for a second that 18th century aesthetics was very much about experience of nature rather than aesthetics in the 19th and 20th centuries, which was much more about experience of art. So this, uh, this prioritizing, this, this, these rules in many ways meant that the experience of someone who works the land was discounted as flawed. And, and so what this does is, you know, this, this approach of, of being disinterested from the land that you experience in order to have an experience of the beautiful, that launches the Romantic era of great poets and artists coming up to places like the Lake District, having experiences of this nature and articulating them artistically. And of course, that in turn gives us our contemporary tourism, um, which is exactly the same. People going to these locations in order to have experiences. It's a very interesting phenomenon when you think of it like that. And of course, this is the embodiment of, 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 of that uh, aesthetic of the sophisticated gent um, in a wild place, having a profound euphoric experience, which is exposing to him, and this is very male, to him, uh, some great revelatory truth. So as a young uh, geography undergraduate, I actually, in order to, to, to go deeper into this, um, I went and did a three week wilderness walk in Arctic Norway. Um, I was, you know, I, and I am a very, you know, very uh, able wilderness traveler. And it was really using that experience. I was kind of centering myself and really using that experience to, to look at uh, the experience of kind of transcendental aesthetic experience and how you, how you, how you access that kind of experience. I came to realize that I was really participating in a certain kind of very male um, and very skewed narrative rooted in the Enlightenment. Um, and I think this uh, quote from Joy Porter really uh, sums it up, that the wilderness is a suitable crucible wherein the lonely, justified Euro-American male may test himself so as to find the ultimate in value and meaning. And I really do think uh, there is a lot in that. And I was definitely guilty of it. And I'm working at the moment with some indigenous colleagues in America on a book about decolonizing arts research. And it's interesting, isn't it, to, to, when, when speaking with indigenous scholars, how the, 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 the whole notion of rewilding is something they've come across already uh, over a hundred years ago, where a kind of romance of the idea of the wild in America 
actually was a driver of clearances from the land um and that the the whole notion of the of the wild and rewilding uh, are, are merely products of a, a slightly toxic binary which is, is 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 driven by kind of toxic masculinity um this is uh, a, 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 a just quote from the um from my chapter in this book i'm gonna have to move my thing there yeah okay so the likes of um Muir and Thoreau promulgated notions of pristine wilderness as places cleared of the indigenous presence for the sake of the recreational enjoyment of civilized whites. Such clearances meant that these landscapes were now fully othered as nature, better able therefore to be enjoyed according to the enlightenment rules of the beautiful and sublime. And this was finally um, written into law in the 1964 Wilderness Act, when it's, that refers to wildernesses as places where man is a visitor who does not remain. What a notion. William Cronon in The uh, Trouble with Wilderness writes, and, and this is where the rewilding thing comes in, because in the UK, the rewilding agenda is driven by a circle of billionaires. Um, and we should probably know better than to trust an agenda that is driven by billionaires. Um, relating back to that first American rewilding that involved clearances of indigenous communities, um, this goes into that toxic masculinity aspect of that impulse. The comforts and seductions of civilized life were especially insidious for men who all too easily became emasculated by the feminizing tendencies of civilization. And as such, the very men who most benefited from urban industrial capitalism were among those who believed they must escape its debilitating effects. And maybe in the chat later, I would like to kind of actually bring up some, some, some examples of actual billionaires who are actually uh, buying up huge swathes of, uh, of Scotland right now. Uh, not so much who wants to be an, a billionaire, but who does a billionaire want to be? Grizzly Adams, perchance. And so to the, um, the, the, the farmer. And uh, this is a photo by Louise Taylor. This was part of a project I did with seven farmers in the Hill, Hill Farmers in uh, Western County Durham in the North, North Pennines. I think this is a really interesting quote. That was Stephen in the picture there. Um, this is the dividing line that my own research is now working on. He says, and this is of farm, uh, farm advisors who are rooted in degree-based knowledge. They're gonna know far more about what a plant needs, certain level of acidity. I wouldn't have a clue about that, but I know when a field looks right or it doesn't look right. And that thing of that kind of knowing through feeling and having that feeling for land, that obviously predates the Enlightenment. So this kind of, this, this understanding that farmers who really intend, who work the land, hill farmers and crofters, they have an understanding and a relationship to land that is, predates the Enlightenment and is not valued in the UK, precisely for the reasons that Louise was saying at the start, this, this struggle to, to escape that enlightenment framework. Thankfully, the arrival of women into environmental aesthetics is beginning to change the narrative. And Pauline von Bondorf writes that the intimate and long-term relationship between farmer and land is understood as having the potential for being a norm of an aesthetic appreciation of landscape. At the moment, if you, were, if you were doing a landscape character assessment of a piece of land, you would ordinarily get a landscape professional to come in and do that, do an appreciation of the aesthetics. Actually, it's the people who work the land who have a full, a fuller, much more full appreciation of that. Likewise, Isis Brook, the farmer's quality of attention and the levels of discernment are what in some of the realms we would refer to as connoisseurship. And just to conclude, uh, it's, it's my, it's all, John Dewey has been my reference point for 
for how do we find a philosophy that can articulate the kind of relationships that farmers have with the land that gets us beyond the human nature binary that that is still so damaging and and destructive for our our policy making our relationship to land and so on and so forth so yeah thank you for that Thanks, Ewan. That was really fascinating. Love it. And um, you know what I saw so obviously is this connection to the binary narratives that Daniel drew in his study, which is, you know, this, the relationship between defend or exploit, which is somehow also, I think, mapped onto this nature culture binary and this sort of perception of, of humans being intrinsically toxic for land. And they, uh, um, anyway, very much. I'm going to move on to Maddie now, if I may, and hand over for your contribution. I don't know if, are you sharing the slides, Maddie? I'm not sure. Yes, I've got some slides. Do you want me to share screen now? Oh, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can you see? Yeah. Yep. Good stuff. <laughs> okay, well, um, how do I follow all of that? Well, I'll just talk about what we do. <laughs> so um, Archie, we're an arts charity uh, based in Barrow and Furness. Um, a bit of a way out at the end of the, the road, dropping off into the sea. Quite an interesting place. Um, and we've worked for a number of years, really, with the environment in, in, in and around Barrow um, and many other sort of northern places. And one of the things that Stuart, who is um, the other artist that I work with on projects, one of the things he's always said, which I thought is so beautiful, I've set here at the beginning of the slides here, our whole environment could be a work of art, in theory at least, yet with nature, art, industry and people. As we all know, the true value lies beyond the aesthetic. So just something to think about, really. That's how we start. So what we do is we're, um, we're a, an, arts, an artist led company. Um, but we work with architects, specialists, biologists, um, archaeologists, and communities um, to revision the social, natural, and built environment. Those three things, things social, very much the, the main important, important part of it. It's very much about people. Natural and built is pretty obvious, but that, that's the order, social, natural, and built. And every project works in that way, really, um, about engaging people. So um, the social, it's for us, I think it's about um, mobilizing and empowering people to work with communities to make change. And I think working with is the main part of that language, the, the most important thing. Uh, it, is a, it is a dialogue, it's a journey that we undertake with a group of people to make change that's right for them and suits the place. Um, and this is these are some images just of uh, projects that a project that we've done called Extreme Views, which was around linking our landscapes and communities. So Barren Furnace, as you might know or not know, is um, a really intense industrial area. We met the nuclear submarines there, but it has the most fascinating coast. We have a whole set of islands and it's the Royal Society of Arts and Industry. Um, rated it number one for its um, landscape heritage assets, natural landscape heritage assets, which is pretty major. Um, people from the Lake District rang me and said, no, it must be wrong. That cannot be true. I said, well, you need to come and have a look. And part of this project was really to get people from the dense terraces in the town out into the landscape. So we went on big tours around the landscape with different uh, specialist speakers, uh, a big conversation with people. And then we set up a dinner table out in the landscape and we ate food that we cooked um, and uh, did a whole series of presentations um, with artworks um, as a way of engaging with the landscape. So the social, um, the natural for us is, is around uh, placing artworks out in that natural landscape. Um, but the, the natural is, it's never one thing, it's many things, you know, it's people, it's places, it's biodiversity. And, and this is um, North Walney Nature Reserve, uh, which is, a, it's a First World War um, training camp. It's a, um, it's a nuclear waste dump in part. Um, it's um, as a, a council tip 
it's got um, big sort of ponds from mining, it's many things, but it's also a place people go and walk and engage with nature. Um, and it's run by um, uh, Natural England. And we did a project um, there around the environment and worked with um, uh, local people to create um, a big tour and map, which is a digital map of the area, as well as putting artworks on site and doing an archaeological dig. And these are the artworks which turned into a non-civic war, war memorial, really, um, around the, the men and boys that had gone off to, to war and trained here and that sort of fragility of that and of, of the nature in a nature reserve. So um, the built of those three things, uh, a lot of things are built that we do are built out in the environment. And these are, this is one of two bird hides on um, South Walney Nature Reserve, um, uh, where we, on, on first look, you go, goodness, a bird hide so bright, will it not scare the birds? And when you start sort of learning, well, when I start learning about stuff, I realise that it makes no difference as long as it stays still um, and doesn't move around. And this, these are, um, these were two bird hides and this one was uh, razzle dazzle hides looking at the history of the, of the island and of, of the south there where the, and the razzle dazzle ships and the fact that it was a military sort of fort at one point. And um, the right hand side is um, um, uh, a bird egg. Uh, produced incredibly large um, so just yeah so what we're trying to do is really create a culture of invention and imagination excuse me my mum ringing <laughs> apologies <laughs> um, creating a culture of invention and imagination which positively embraces risk as an opportunity for change um, other things that are around built these are worker off-grid pods they've got solar panels steam bent oak battery packs on the bottom half of them, small wind turbines, um, sort of working with old technologies and new technologies to try and sort of engage people um, with their environment. And these, uh, these pods we created go down onto the beach to allow for pond dipping and um, an engagement with, with the, the sort of beach culture. And if I get, if I had a pound for every time a council officer said, well, we can't do that because I would be a very rich lady. Um, but so for me, often it's about tackling that imagination de deficit and that risk averse sort of culture. And I think that's what we do as artists is we, we challenge that and we take, take it on as something that, that allows us to create something um, that's right for place, but pushes things forward a bit more. And I, I delight in the fact that that's something I can, I can do. That risk thing is, is something we, we always engage with as we start a project because we don't know what it's going to be until we've made it and we've got there and i think that's that to me is something we can offer to to other um disciplines and then also understanding the power in communicating complex and serious concerns and ideas humor is for me a really important part of how you engage how you talk about place how you talk about the environment communities problems you know, we all want to laugh. We all want to be able to delight in something. And this is uh, an inflated house that I built, um, made and inflated and took on tours around the county. This is from a, an area in Barrow where the dense terraces are that were being knocked down. And there is something delightful in making something that's a balloon essentially, that goes up, makes people laugh and then goes down. And it begins that conversation. So I think always to understand those yeah, understand how serious things can be talked about with mildly humorous things. Um, yeah. So the project that we that we've been running for a number of years now is called Allotment Soup. Um, it started off um, as a conversation with local people around how to develop the islands of bays of Barrow um, sustainably, and very quickly went into this mad lot of old blokes that hadn't got allotments and we must be the council, how do we get allotments? Anyway, we went on a big journey with them um, and uh, got a piece of land and said, look, let's do some self-managed allotments. This is how it started off. This was in the first year. Um, food futures and biodiversity has become our sort of strap line, really. Um, it's a lot more than an allotment. It's a way of engaging people. It's a way of engaging people with land and getting access back to land. Uh, Barrow has, I've talked about the dense terraces, people don't have um, gardens in Barrow, they don't have a front garden. 
They have a very small backyard that holds two bins and a bike if you're lucky. And people don't have access, oddly, to a place to grow. Um, there is a coast, but you walk on the coast. You, you know, you can't sort of grow things. You can't get mucky. Um, and this is part of this uh, part of the appeal of this this place, um, really, that it's it's allowed children and young people to feel very much um, at one with nature. I would say we we run a lot of projects here. Um, we have many partners. We work with health and well-being teams. We work with adults um, with learning difficulties. We work with autism groups. Um, we work with all comers. Anybody who comes, we we work with them, but we run a, a few very definite projects, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. I just love this picture. This lass had to be put in the bath afterwards um, and hose down, uh, her dad said. So I just thought, great. I used to be like that as a kid, but in Barrow, people are a bit averse to, to muck. You know, they're not used to, it's not Lake District. It's not the rest of the county. It's a very urban place. So allotment soup is um, on Walney Island and it's, we call it, it's a, uh, Allotment Soup is a project, but it's a community growing space and it's open to everyone. We started it off, um, as I say, about six years ago, and it was all around um, the idea of an allotment soup where it would be a whole mismatch mash of different things that you gathered together. It'd be art, it'd be environment, it'd be biodiversity, community and food. So every event we do is based around food or has been prior to, to, to COVID. I cook, the artists cook, whoever's there cook. So everything that we produce gets made into um, soup or um, other food a bit later on for other events. But one of the big things that we've done has been tree planting. And I've never known such a project to engage communities throughout that legacy where you have families coming, you have older people with their sort of infant kids saying, I want to do something for the future for my children. So tree planting has been a really big, big project and a big part of what we've been doing. I mean, it's, a, it's an enormous horse field next to what was an old pub. Um, uh, and you can see in the distance there on that bottom um, uh, photograph. Uh, we've created hedges, we've, we've created a forest. We've built the biggest pond, which has been called Lake Windermere by people locally, as a way of draining the field, because it would be in a quagmire during, during the, um, uh, most of the year, apart from the summer. The thing, the project evolves. Every single thing we do moves us on to the next thing. But throughout, it's been about food. It's been about community. And we listen as part of what we do. We take people on that journey. We, we begin to understand why they're not accessing land and why they find it fearful. It's often to do with scale. We had this epically large field. It was too scary for people to be involved with. The second we made one meter square boxes, we were overrun with people wanting to be involved. So, so accessible small steps for people is often a route in. Um, we work a lot with schools and uh, organise sort of groups. Uh, this is an autism group and uh, a summer um, uh, workshops that we did over the summer during lockdown. Um, because of course allotment spaces could be open as well and focused groups that had their own bubbles we could work with as well. Um, so we do anything from drawing to looking at sort of pond dipping, nature events, um, whatever seems right for the people in the project. But ultimately, it's about growing food. It's around looking at the biodiversity of a site and how we can develop that. And it's around working with um, young and old to help support nature. So we have a, a, a third of it is given over to small allotments and then, then the other two thirds is around all of the project work that we do and deliver. Um, anything from mad stuff with kids, um, which was quite good fun, um, to um, a lot of other sort of quite organised projects that we work on. So we're currently working on um, an unreserved um, green place plan for Walney. So it's Walney Island, which is a long sort of barrier island to the um, to the on the edge of Barrow, and we're looking at the green places that are accessible to people, um, doing a landscape assessment, but also doing adding a very large social aspect to it, how people access these spaces, how they're perceived as being accessible or not, and um, how they're used, whether it's dog walking and pooing or it's football and burning a car. These are all part of people's lives, so it seems. Anyway, so we've been sort of working uh, a lot on this uh, Walney Green Place plan. We're working with uh, the University of Cumbria on a, uh, a two-year project 
um, that's been extended because of lockdown around um, species restoration. We've been looking at growing on various species from um, cowslips to help support the Duke of Burgundy butterfly, um, which is the foodstuff for the Duke of Burgundy butterfly. Um, which is a rare and um, um, reducing butterfly to um, planting out sort of kidney vetch and growing it on and planting it out on the Barra slag banks. Kidney vetch supports the small blue butterfly. Um, it's their foodstuff. So we're doing a lot of work with universities around things like that. Also aspen trees, planting, growing on and planting out aspen trees. During the first lockdown, we we grew and, um, or we, we finished growing. And during the first lockdown, um, Millen Prison took um, 800 uh, aspen trees we've been growing to build their own um, forest. We're also working with Natural England around a project around Arctic alpines in a similar sort of way to um, uh, grow on a whole set of different trees and willows which will be planted out high up on the Lake District Fells to retain water and runoff during sort of um, bad rainfall, essentially. Um, so the project that we've just finished, I'm still very tired from it, is, is a two week intensive um, uh, artist's residency. Uh, we work with um, four artists around um, the lead up to, or the, the COP26, We've been working with Barbara Council on um, uh, low carbon barrow, and we're currently hosting a, um, a carbon uh, reduction uh, officer who's working with communities to help um, support grants to be given out. So uh, as part of that, and as part of the, the focus of really of our work, looking at biodiversity and species restoration and supporting um, uh, various initiatives that help um, climate change, help uh, reduce climate change. The whole focus really of our um, residency looked at uh, climate change and um, the support of um, low carbon initiatives. We had various speakers, we had about 12 different speakers um, in, in the polytunnels among the tomatoes. Um, we had artworks, we had food, um, I wrote a list of things we have, which started. To, I started to feel wearisome on that list. It was talks, tours, food demo, demonstrations, conversations, composting, music, soup, pickling, a lot more food. All the foods made and um, on site and fed to people, um, as well as sort of tours and um, um, uh, people. To, yeah, many many things. So here's some of the images from it. Um, artworks here. Only radical solutions are left. No more hot air. Uh, this is a cookery demonstration by Mig, who is um, uh, one of the Filipino community in Barrow. Mig runs a, a, a cafe called Sweet Pepper. And one of the artists was from the Philippines who, um, uh, who connected a lot with sort of the local Filipino community. So we had a huge um, uh, contingent of people coming with uh, um, very sort of interesting and diverse sort of ways of engaging with landscape, very different um, understanding of landscape. Meg is internationally renamed and famous on social media. So he did a live stream <laughs> cooking demonstration. I think, I think it um, for us was just quite astonishing um, and fed us all, which was, was an amazing sort of thing. And then um, it went through into the evening with uh, lights and uh, you know, light walks through the, the, the site. And these are some moth traps uh, which were from a previous event we did, but I just thought they said a great deal about what we're about. Interested in landscape, heritage, future, communities, more people, species and habitats. They're some of the things that we cover and work on. And ultimately around risk and ideas. So um, that's, that's me briefly. Uh, so thank you very much. Let me just stop my screen sharing. And there's a, my email and uh, website. So please do look. Hold on, I'm, I'm not stopping the sharing. No, you have done that. That's I have. Oh, OK, yeah. that's great. Yeah. Lovely. Thank thanks you. For, thanks very much, Maddie. Lovely to see all those things happening, especially all those things you've been doing over the last two weeks in the freezing cold. In the freezing cold, indeed, yeah. yeah. It's, it's really, really great to see examples of these projects and practice and all the pictures from them, too. So thanks very much. Um, so I... Um, we're going to hand over to Charlie now, I think, if you'd like to say a word, Charlie, about 
Future Places and, um, and your book. Hello, can you see that? Can everybody see that? Yeah, we can see that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm probably the least serious person today, so I'll just live with that. But just to talk a bit about, firstly, um, my, some of the ways I think nature writing needs to change very possibly. This is what you get if you Google Lake District on a Google image. Um, as you can see, as you all know, the Lake District is permanently sunny absolutely empty, um, extremely um, beautiful and very un untroubled place. So um, we know, of course, it's nothing like that. And I've been up here for 16 years and that's been mostly my experience of the Lake District. Uh, well, not all the time, but a lot of the time, uh, to be honest. And um, perhaps following Ewan, I tend not so much to blame Wordsworth, among other people, but more the idea of Wordsworth Shire, which has been my shorthand for a certain romanticization of the landscape of the Lake District, Wordsworth country, call it what you will. And um, as we know, this is something a bit more like what the Lake District often is in, in the summer, particularly. Um, congestion, the hell that is Windermere, um, and this summer in particular, of course, the atrocities around people just leaving litter everywhere um, with the millions and millions of visitors who come and in a way completely subvert or invert the whole point of that Lake District and some of the ways it gets misunderstood. So among the things in interesting me for a long time as somebody who comes from outside is to rethink how we imagine the Lake District. Uh, oh yes, and there's a problem of whether the sheep farming in the Lake District is actually sensible, whether it's overgrazing, whether this has led to biodiversity and so on, uh, biodiversity lack, I should say, and so on and so forth. And of course, um, and I think Maddie will recognise some of this, um, that the northwest of England is not just a Lake District and it is a much more complex and humanly worked landscape that has slavery, nuclear power, nuclear submarines, the work of the navvies, um, and a whole series of elements that really largely get written out of the narrative, as far as I can see. So it's this that led me to write this book with this flippant and irritatingly provocative title, I Hate the Lake District, which was an attempt to kind of, as it were, grasp what I saw as a problem in some of the ways that areas like this are described, narrativized, romanticized, in which things that aren't don't fit a certain picture excluded, and so on. And I was particularly attacking what I call the, the Waterstones Natural Nature Writing uh, Table. And there is actually an actual picture of a Waterstones Nature Writing Table I took. And on the left, there is a quote from Kathleen Jamie's notorious uh, review of Robert McFarlane in London Review of Books. What's that coming over the hill? A white middle-class Englishman, a lone enraptured male from Cambridge, here to boldly go discovering and quelling our harsh and lovely and sometimes difficult land with his civilised lyrical words. When he compounds this by declaring that to reach a wild place was for me to step outside human history, I'm not just groaning, but banging my head on the table. I, um, though I am also a lone, not necessarily very enraptured, but a lone male, nevertheless, I do feel quite a lot of sympathy with that point of view. And so the title of I Hate the Lake District really comes from a t-shirt that John Lydon, Johnny Rotten War and the Sex Pistols in 1977, which he borrowed I Hate above uh, a, a Pink Floyd or top of a, a Pink Floyd t-shirt. And um, of course, as he admitted then and more recently, he didn't hate Pink Floyd, but he hated the sub pomposity of surrounding them. And it's the same way I don't hate the Lake District, but I hate the way it gets discussed. And I wanted to find new forms of nature writing, or not nature writing, writing about the environment surrounds us that would be more real and less romanticized. And I found at least one of the ways of thinking about this through uh, a kind of genre of writing or a movement called the New Narrative, which was a series of writers in San Francisco from the mid 70s to mid 90s who were fueled by, as it says here, punk, pop, porn, French theory, and a social struggle to change writing forever. I thought, what's, what's not to love there? And so that became 
a way of thinking about how you might write this differently. Uh, and so here are some of the um, exemplars of this kind of writing, which I looked at when I was um, writing this book. We, my Maggie Nelson and Dodie Bellamy, I don't know if you know these writers, but they write very, what sounds called auto fiction. Uh, on the right is Notes May Well Falling by my friend and colleague Jen Ashworth. And in fact, she and I wrote, she wrote notes and I wrote, I hate kind of together. We would send each other um, drafts of work as it went on, in both pursuing, trying to think differently about writing. Um, and I took my ways of thinking about this from a number of sources, uh, radical non-dual ecology, coming out of radical forms of Buddhism, exo-feminism, exo a kind of um, non-binary form of feminism, the work of someone like Eugene Thacker, and also examples from uh, moving image culture on the right, some, some of you know that recognize that, is a still from Tarkovsky's Stalker, and the bottom left is a still from a film based on Jeff Vandermeer's Annihilation, both of which give us complex spaces that cannot be romanticized or divided easily into human, non-human binaries or nature culture binaries and gave me a richer way to think about this kind of um, landscape. But what the funny thing happened is that despite deep resistance on my part, I found myself becoming a kind of accidental environmentalist, not least because I started to do some work with Karen Lloyd, who uh, wrote a very good book about Morecambe Bay and it was a PhD candidate um, and scholar here in Lancaster, and she and I have done a fair amount of work around the theme of reimagining the Lake District as a way of trying to think um, that what is a, what the problem here is not just the practicalities of how the landscape is used, tourism, farming, etc., but the kind of imagination that, um, or kind of way we are led to think about how we should imagine this landscape and how we might change that. Uh, and the other thing that came as a consequence of the book was I became a co-investigator on the Future Places Centre at Lancaster University, where in fact Karen is now a writer in residence, um, which is one of the six digital economy centres that the Research Councils UK have funded. And Future Places is about um, the environment, about the Bay in particular, and about how we um, might think about using data uh, to make our lives better in these circumstances. I think I was brought onto it to expand the idea of what data are beyond that of being merely digital data or quantitative data and to think that things like literature and other forms of artistic practice can also be data. And one of the outcomes of this, I'm sorry Louise, there's a picture of us making the film, I've taken the picture, uh, is we've got some funding, um, Louise got some funding and I added a bit to it from Future Places, to make a film, which is the film we were supposed to be showing tonight and which a number of people participate in. Uh, Hannah, who's there as one of the people who um, was interviewed for it. And there is Maria Benjamin of uh, Dodgson Wood near Coniston. And the idea was to go to parts of Lake District and interview people in situ and get them to tell us what there is there, what there is to look at, how the land is being used, how it is actually properly used, not how it is romanticized in those, as in those Google images, but to think more cogently about what the landscape is really about. And I just want to pick out from my last two slides, two of the many key moments, which um, really I find revelatory in, make, in this process. One was the trip to Wet Sleddle uh, we made to interview Ewan, uh, in which Ewan gave us a brilliant insight into uh, the geological and worked and quarried nature of this landscape. It, it is, of course, as we all know, far from being quote unquote natural, but it was very good to talk with somebody who um, could actually, in front of the dry stone wall, describe how it is made, what it means, how it divides the landscape up, what it means for the landscape. Um, and that was Ewan and the other moment I just want to cite was um, basically our confrontation of a piece of cow shit with Tim Winder, um, who's one of the Autumn Farms cluster. And this is my transcription of his discourse, his peon around um, this cow shit. We're changing the way we work with our, work our cattle. Instead of using ivermectin wormer, we're using a panicle wormer, which is more old fashioned. What it does, what the cows leave behind, the cow pat, whatever, 
It doesn't kill all insects in it. Ivermectin based worma used to kill all the insects in the cow pat. So there's nothing could live in, it, in that after it landed on the ground. Now with this, there's all sorts of living creatures are in there. Beetles, little worms, all making their own little life in every cow pat. So this cow pat, or whatever we call it, is certainly better for soil. It decomposes, it breaks down. So as I said, having the worms, the beetles and everything else, and then we have over things come to feed off that, whether it be a badger or the hedgehog, come and scratch through that in the night and lift off the little creatures. And that was for me a revelation about seeing the landscape at a different scale, seeing it through a different lens, seeing it in a way that explains something very differently to the usual view of a lone hill and a lake, and understanding the interrelationship of all the different um, creatures and other artifacts, such as this cow shit, that were part of that. So I will stop there. And there we go. A race through that. Yeah, thanks so much, Charlie. Um, that's actually very helpful that you've also shown some pictures and given some feedback on making the film and indeed um, <clears throat> your own moments of revelation and transformation or learning, I guess, around the project actually. And that I think is a good segue into a conversation that we could have because <clears throat> I suppose the, the way that I've built this session is the role of arts, cre creativity and culture in the agricultural transition. And we have talked about many things that are about culture, narratives, history, philosophy, ways of seeing the world, ways of understanding the world, which of course have implications for um, the way that, that policy is constructed and the way that people respond to those sorts of policy situations. And so I'm conscious a little bit of the time being quite short at the moment. We've only got eight minutes left um, <laughs> of the session, which is completely fine. And I wanted to just open up maybe just to use the last few minutes and we can by all means stay on a bit longer, I think, Becky, if that, if that works. Yeah, if anybody wants to stay on longer for um, more conversation. But I did just want to give us a chance to have a conversation together and ask some questions. Um, and I was going to kick off, actually, and just um, ask Ewan whether he thought um, that is the is DEFRA a toxic masculine? <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Good, good question. Is it? Is it? I think it's imbued. Uh, I think a lot of the narratives, thinking of what Daniel was, was explaining to us, I think a lot of the narratives are imbued with decades and decades of toxic masculinity around ideas, say, of, you know, this is the problem with the Enlightenment, isn't it? It was, it was, it was, it was, it was all about ideas of superiority and inferiority. And I think there's something, there is something very toxic male about, uh, about bringing that polarity into everything. So in terms of DEFRA, and, and I'd be interested to hear what Connor has to say in the Northern Irish context. I'm working with a group of farmers in Ireland at the moment, and an interesting really interesting thing has been happening in Ireland, where thanks to a, a group of farmers and a PhD researcher at the Burren, there's been this mm. implementation of what's referred to as locally led agri-environment policy, um, which I think in the UK was still some way off of reconciling ourselves to, where actually the ministers um, in the Department of Agriculture were persuaded to put the design of agri-environment schemes into the hands of that local farming group. And so in a way, what I was talking about in my presentation was also, was almost, and in my PhD, it's, a, it's, it's what, it's the philosophy of the locally led. And, and Maddie, obviously what you're doing in Barrow is very much about that locally led approach and, um, and so on. So I think DEFRA has a long way to go before it can really, because this is about relinquishing, isn't it? It's about relinquishing control. And the UK government 
does not have an instinct for relinquishing control. Does that answer your question, Louise? Yeah, very perfectly, actually, because it's supported also by Hannah's comment, and Hannah has a lot of experience working in this field, and Medefra says that they don't listen um, and act upon the listening, they get told, and then everything goes into a black hole. Um, <clears throat> and so, so, yes, I think absolutely the centralization and the, the sort of seeking of control and reproducing these, these narratives and things that they've inherited um, we've all inherited actually to some degree. I think it's probably also worth pointing that out that we are all embedded in this, this way of seeing the world to some extent. And it's sort of the challenge I suppose is, is how to collectively move forward together without fighting about it perhaps too much but understanding one another's positions. Um, does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask of any of the panel or of each other or um, of anybody else? Yeah, I'd like to ask a question, maybe just to everyone, um, on this kind of topic of like, you know, how, how much do we need policy to be doing stuff, and actually, how much is community community ventures doing things? So I always feel like the ground up stuff is is a you know, it's the stuff that takes action and really is really positive. Um, and I have these same feelings, I think, as Hannah. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just, it seems to be so difficult to make any change at policy level. And you can write as many policy briefs as you want, and it doesn't really go anywhere. Um, so, I mean, I guess I get to the point where it's like, <clears throat> how much do you just kind of ignore policy and just, you know, do as much on the groundwork as possible and 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 I guess as all networking as much as possible to to strengthen those communities and that action um yeah at, at what point do we do we give up on policy I wonder can I just I'll just add in there with some stuff I mean I think you know we have to constantly um do um, and I'm a doer, uh, and I think it's really important that you do and listen and and go on a journey with people, you know, and things. There is power in people, you know, um, certainly in somewhere like Barrow, you know, people are very vocal about what they want to do, what they think, um, and in part why I, I titled a project Extreme Views, because it was perceptual views and political views and every single view you could think about and certainly in Barrow people are I would call them shouty you know they they have a view and I think it's you know if you're I think policy fantastic if policy changes but it has to be a two-pronged thing and it, it can only happen really with a sway of public opinion and certainly here the more we do the more people that are involved the more people engage the more people actively want things to change, um, then things will change. But policy often comes with money as well, which allows things to happen. And I think without that, not much can happen. I spend a lot of my time um, fundraising for something that I just a gobsmacked shouldn't, that, does, that str we struggle to get funding to do stuff. So mostly it's done for free. Um, and it just amazes me, we should be, you know, we're doing everything, we're doing biodiversity, growing things, you know, um, forest gardens, you know, a thousand and one projects within that, none of it's paid for, it's all done on goodwill, but there's a lot of that out there and people want things to happen. And I would say, have a go, do it if you can, um, and, and hopefully people listen, but also try and get the ear of councillors, local um, bigwigs, people that are... Um, or see themselves as being quite important um, and then help hopefully that will help to um, to change opinion a bit further along the line so that's my view does anybody else have anything to add to that because i i say a word yeah i, I wouldn't mind actually uh, louise if i could yeah. with northern heartlands i think that's the right i'll just put it in the text there the our great place scheme uh, jasmine in a way we had this this operating idea of imagine an hourglass, you know, and you've got top down policy initiatives and then you've got bottom up, ground up uh, expertise and capacity. 
And we felt the artist could, in a way, take that pinch point of that hourglass and turn it around and facilitate movements of expertise that exists at the ground up level, facilitate movements of that type of, type of understanding into that top down sphere, and at the same time, translate some of that top down, you know, often well meaning policy uh, intent down at the, at, the, at the grassroots level where it doesn't always land because of the language that's used and so on. So I think in terms of the title of this session, Louise, I think that's a really interesting, you know, that facility of artists to translate, to mediate between the top down and bottom up. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me of a quote that, of a, a letter that was sent to Queen Victoria from her uncle Leopold I, where he says, be prudent in your dealings with artists they mix with all classes of society and are, for that very reason, dangerous. And I think that dangerous <laughs> potential that we can exploit as, as artists and creatives and, and is in times of transition, that danger becomes something that society desperately calls out for. <clears throat> yeah, thanks very much, you and that. Um... That's really helpful and valuable. I, I haven't actually had a chance to talk through what I was going to talk through, and I don't think it's really that necessary to go into it in much detail. But I was just going to briefly introduce a project that um, Charlie and I are developing at the moment at Lancaster called The Once and Future Land, which is specifically to, to try and experiment and play with the things that Ewan and Maddie are, are talking about, which is, you know, creating spaces of risk, using the sort of dangerous identity and role of artists, the sort of subversive, humorous, disorientating sometimes, provocative, and you know you can get away with a lot, I think, if it's called art to some degree, to really test the ground for what it would mean to involve expert knowledge makers and policy makers as, or, as an audience and as a public that are also embedded in these kind of place-based can participative art projects, specifically all sharing the question as horizontal participants and concerned citizens first and foremost about the future of land in this country. You know, really putting this back on the table and thinking about what it means through the changes of the agriculture transition. So this, this project that, that Charlie and I are looking to get off the ground um, would be, um, a three-year process that would be um, fomenting relationships between artists, land managers or workers, people from policy settings like Natural England or so on, um, into um, workshop processes who can collectively curate experiences that will, innate, that will enable walking methods, walk and talk methods of people to drift through territory together, very diverse groups of people, which doesn't involve parliamentarians and does involve people from DEFRA or United Utilities or Natural Trust, along with all the people who are actually from that area and taking care of that area, in order to have similar experiences to what Charlie did around the Cowpap, to have these moments of revelation and insight that you can really only get through direct experience, very sensorial, kind of emotional and quite challenging experiences actually to some degree. And um, part of the session today was that I was, we, we wanted to try and start having this conversation and sort of register interest from anybody that would like to be involved as this sort of unfolds over the next few months. If you would, then please pop your email in the chat. Although I actually have everyone's email here except for Connor, Jasmine and Eddie. <laughs> but anyway, so I just wanted to share that idea because that's that's very much the, the premise of this project, which is to test what is possible, which isn't writing policy briefs, Jasmine, you know, like how far can you take it when you've got somebody in a field, freezing cold ankle deep in mud, looking at a cow pat and, you know, and talking with people. So, so perhaps I'll leave it there and because we are at time now, but we can continue to having a conversation if anybody wants to share anything else. I think Becky... You said you you were you had all these thoughts about a book that 
for you. The but. only thing, yeah, if it's like I can put, just plug that. I love this book. I so you can't see it because of my weird screen share thing. Um, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Does anyone know this book? Yeah, I just love it. Like, because yeah, hands gone. Um, and tell me anyone else if you do hate it, because I haven't found anyone that hates it yet. So I feel like there might be something I'm missing. But I just, I mean, obviously she's an indigenous. She's a plant ecologist. She's um, but she's an indigenous a member of uh, the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. So she's, and yeah, I mean her opening chapter is just awesome where she talks about I mean you know what Daniel said about like cultural narratives and stuff I mean she contrasts obviously the, um, okay. the kind of story of Sky Woman that a lot of um that's shared by a lot of the indigenous groups in North America um you know that idea of like human kind of I don't know coming to earth and being like on a level with and being assisted by animals and being like you know there's no high as opposed to contrasting that with like Adam and Eve you know and the um where they're kind of put in charge of nature and then they mess up and get like exiled from it and it's you know um and she has this this thing which she talks about with her students which really resonates with me and mine you know she, she asks her students who are like environmental study students and she's they can't think of a single beneficial interaction between humans and nature and that's why you and I loved your slide because you can see where that's the where that's where the wilding thing comes from right it's like humans are entirely bad and we need to like exclude them if nature's going to have any chance and she's like no that's just complete rubbish like um you know can we think of land as relationship and for me the great breakthrough there has been like through craft like crafting with natural materials because um you know i well, I've got a friend who's like a coffee craft teacher and um, tutor, and she's been teaching me. And I've been working with like local wool and things. And you just you start to really notice in micro like the different properties of all these things, and you start to be hugely grateful for you know you see all the things that the landscape gives you. And yeah, it's just such a totally different. Um, you know, I mean, I've always loved rural areas and stuff, and I grew up in one. But yeah, and for years I went like walking in the Lake District and loved it. And and you know now it, yeah, it's still beautiful scenery and it's still amazing. But I just get so much more out of those kind of yeah like those when you're actually working with the land like interacting with it like experiencing that reciprocity for yourself and creativity and like it in community with others as well human and non-human um I just think it's awesome and that's not even before we touch on the stuff about you know I guess the grammar of animacy and like different um you know I'd, I'd never thought about that how different languages it's just amazing to me so anyway sorry I'll stop there but if if people like this kind of thing I don't know what any of the speakers or anyone else here thinks but I'd just massively recommend that book um as well <laughs> thanks thanks Becky would anyone else like to say anything else um we I don't know if I want to open up the debate but I'm curious about rewilding because I think about it a lot and I was just thinking about it after you and had spoken about it and I think I've got kind of two juxtaposed experiences of rewilding as a term. So I've gone through a journey of being really excited about it as a conservation graduate through to working with farmers and understanding that it's a very colonial thing. And now I feel like the act of rewilding can be very colonial, but then also the word of uh, rewilding has been colonized by like academia trying to define what it is um so I ended up in this conversation where we had like a panel on the stage talking about rewilding it was very frustrating because it was a tent full of like it, people that were excited about nature recovery essentially and what they could do in their gardens and in their local parks and they were just totally um trodden on by the experts saying that's not rewilding um so yeah I don't know it's a really interesting kind of term because I still feel like it has value in getting children and young people and possibly more urban people excited about nature recovery and climate action and all of that kind of stuff but then the reality is that I've spoken to farmers more than once who have been they just say well it's another upland clearance mm -hmm. and so then it makes me really angry so <laughs> it's just a really kind of juxt it yeah it's like holding you're trying to hold this binary in my head over a single term and it gets yeah navigating that can be quite challenging when I work with kind of the farming community but I be really believe in nature recovery but I believe that connection to land is the way to do it um 
so yeah I don't know I'll stop there I did, it's not really a question I was just thinking about it <laughs> yeah I mean that resonates a lot with me Hannah and, and just the idea of um sort of making peace a little bit with the complexity of everything and like actually the semantic um breadth I guess of a term like rewilding and then the complexities around these very potent terminologies and language you know natural capital was some is another one you know like it's recognized to actually be hugely impoverished I mean it is hugely impoverished what it does what it is actually meaning but it's basically used because it's a useful communication tool and so I mean it would be interesting to hear what Daniel, as our resident narratives expert, thinks of that those complexities with just trying to shift narratives at the same time as recognizing their utility for some contexts and then trying to manage the degree to which they get reinterpreted or molded to another particular agenda that someone has. And do you have any views on that, Daniel? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting point. And I do think that yeah it's important not to you know how to put this i think there's two there's two two elements to it in that i think you know one is you have to deal with the situation as it is and where we are and 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 we're not going to switch overnight to a situation in which people are going to immediately kind of overcome the sort of centuries of, of of thinking through in certain ways that that Ewan was was explaining in such an interesting way earlier you know that there is going to be you know rewilding is going to be problematic because our entire way of thinking about land and nature is problematic right it's not it would be it's not going to be something that's going to just suddenly come out of nowhere and, and have a completely different character to it and so I you know despite I think there being very obviously elements in rewilding and the discourse around it that reinforce this idea of a sort of separate domain nature and all of this and, and uh, not helping us sort of getting humans away from the land and off nature and sort of protecting it from them and, and, and that being you know I think I still do feel a level of enthusiasm for it because I think that you know we, if we want to move towards the idea of changing the relationship with land and thinking of the land as something that isn't you know fixed and stuck in this this one kind of relationship away and think of it as it is there is energy there and there are you know it's about kind of you know changing what rewilding means you know and and changing the idea of of wild and using it as a vehicle to move the conversation forward and i think that you know i would be i think it should be a it's a wave to be surfed onto a bear wave rather than necessarily being something that where the best use of the energy is to kind of push back on it and deflate it and defeat it you know um because you know yeah it's it's a the long process and lots of very deeply embedded narratives that are you know related to that and that, that kind of are responsible for some of the, the elements of it that we don't like um if that makes sense <laughs> so yeah I, I i have similarly mixed feelings but i do think that like there is value in in rewilding as an agenda that we shouldn't entirely discard because it's difficult to engage people in in the way that it has in these mm -hmm. topics and i think that energy can be used productively um even if there are a lot of agendas at play which are and are trying to use it for not such great ends um yeah cool yeah thank you and charlie very briefly i just wish somebody tell me what wild means well actually i mean maybe i can uh, the comp what i was thinking of when daniel was just explaining that to me is that perhaps rewilding which points to humans abstractly being problematic is missing the point that in fact what we're wrestling with is neoliberal industrialized modernity and that is actually the binary point somehow and that always gets left out of the picture so it's not the humans that are the problem it's these these socioeconomic technology systems, which, which are the problem, in fact, and so a, a depoliticized, rewilding conversation about, you know, what it means I, to not be wild, I think, would be very, very helpful. I think vague, you know, as well. I think vague terms are useful, actually, as well. You know, mm -hmm. like, uh, there's reasons that they become popular. 
like people sometimes need to sort of come together under things where we have a slightly different interpretation of what it means and then i think that just puts the responsibility on those of us with different who want who think that mm. we have a particular understanding of that that maybe things need rewilding other than just landscapes you know or that you know there's a different conception of wildness that we need to come up with and some of the other things that think those are things that need to be pushed forward within this because yeah there's otherwise just a general vagueness is an opportunity i think there mm. yeah can i just say where do we go back to with rewilding so i'm just going to throw some things in here i also think just other stuff that's come to me is perceptions of place i think a lot of what charlie was talking about was perceptions of place and in somewhere like barrow people have a perception of, of a place as they do in in the lake district i think there's a hierarchy of class within all of this language that we're talking about here especially to do with rewilding um and all of the other bits of you know terminology um that are quite alienating to uh, particular areas of society you know either diverse groups or you know why are there so few black people out in the um in in the lake district you know just throw that in there you know there there is a lot of um there's a lot of holding using language and not allowing other people in and i think that's a problem and i'm constantly trying to break those barriers down um certainly around class value systems i think we value what we value you know who are we um and different people's value systems are really not being looked at you know is the white working class man perhaps the white and um, middle class man perhaps what are all those other different value systems and how do people use and work with and engage with uh, landscape and how is that biodiversity supported for them and how can we make change that takes everybody forward um so there are things that that I'm constantly tussling with all the time. And that's why just latterly it's been quite exciting the work that we've been doing um, on the community grown space with very different communities. Um, anyway, I'll shut up. Thanks so much, Maddy. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think this sort of work is absolutely vital and it's slow and messy, I'm sure, and um, difficult, <laughs> but very, very worthwhile. Um, well, look, I mean, we're, we're getting close to 10 to uh, 8, um, 10 to 9. I, does anybody else have anything that they would like to say? In, or if we can probably close it down. Please just um, pop your email addresses if you haven't done already and you'd like to stay in touch. That would be lovely. You can send some information about this project as it unfolds. Otherwise, I'm going to say thank you very much to everyone for contributing and everybody for participating in the conversation afterwards i've enjoyed it greatly i've learned a lot and um i hope i'll see you all in person very soon thank you and we have to save this chat becky are you okay to do that and then i've saved the chat yes thank so you. okay it should probably. be fine and it's been recorded and i think all the recordings will be made available at somewhere probably on the food features youtube um very soon yeah. so yeah cool. Okay, well, thanks very much. Have a lovely evening, all. See you again. Thanks, everyone. Okay, bye. Bye.